My lesson this morning is uh, God will take care of you. And you could read that as God will take care of you or God will take care of you. Because both are true. God guarantees that he will take care of you. And as we've said many times, the condition on that is based on what we choose to do and how we choose to approach our life and how we choose to either listen to God's word or ignore God's word. And the first topic I'd like to talk about is the God who gives. And we can think about what is it that God has given to us. And the list is really long and varied. We talked a little bit about it in the adult Sunday school class this morning that God's given us the words that are written so that we can learn what he wants for us. But before that, God gave us life. Before that, God came up with a plan. And his plan was for people that chose him, people that followed him, people that obeyed him, to live forever with him. So think about different ways that God gives to you as we go through this. First passage is going to be Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 8. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. What is the natural human tendency? What, what do we naturally do when we're confronted with a problem or we... We want to figure out how to do something. The natural tendency is to go, well, I'm a smart guy. I'm a smart enough person. I can figure this out. I'll make a plan. And for anybody that's done that and failed, we realize that that's part of the process of life. God's given us a huge benefit, a huge example, and a huge help in the words that he's given us. He's given us his words, his instruction, and his wisdom. If we just submit to him, if we submit to his words, if we lean on his understanding, if we follow his path, he's done all the footwork for us. He's set up the way that we can succeed. It's just a blueprint. We follow the steps. When we get to the end of this lesson, I'm going to circle back to this idea of leaning not under your own understanding. And I think that it ties together with what we're supposed to do once we've settled down God's path and once, once we've determined that we're going to follow his way and once we've determined that we're going to use his understanding to guide our life. I think there's another step to this than just looking inward and saying, am I leaning on my own understanding? And am I following God's plan? There's, there's another step beyond this. But if we do this, if we decide that we're not going to be wise in our own eyes, that we're not, we're not the plan maker, we're told that it will bring health to our body and nourishment to our bones. I could use a little bit of that right now. 2 Peter 1, verses 1 through 3. Peter writes, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. So thinking about this in the, in the context of a God who gives, if God expects us to obey him, wouldn't it follow that he would tell us what to do. 
if God expects us to lean on his understanding, if God expects us to do what he asks us to do, doesn't it make sense that God has given us the things that we need to find out what he wants us to do? And another thought about that is God gave us the Bible. God gave us the word through the prophets and through those that scribed these words. And we talked about that a lot at the end of the adult class this morning. Is God provided and he preserved his word enough that we can find out what he wants from us. He went through a lot of effort to make sure that the words that we have in front of us will lead to salvation. It's important that we know those words. It's important that we read those words. And it's important that we don't say, eh, you know, I think the Bible's a good story, but I don't think we need to do everything that's written. I don't think it's important that we, we do all of that. If God went to the effort to preserve this, if God went to the effort to get this written down and told to the people, I think it's important that we honor that and say, if it's in the Bible, it's probably important for our salvation. If it's in the Bible, God went to an effort to make sure that it was there so that we had words we could learn from and words that we could mold into our own understanding. Words we could lean on, words we could say, God felt this was important. In verse four, kind of cha- uh, verse four here kind of just summarizes that through those words he's given his very great and precious promises. So it's not just instruction; it's also the word and the the reward that he's promised. Remember the first slide: God will take care of you. He's detailed out his promises, and he's detailed out the steps to get there, and he's detailed out the attitudes and the behavior that he's looking for. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, 14 through 17, you, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from which you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Yeah, he's given us all of the things that we need to equip ourselves for every good work. He hasn't left anything out that's important. He has left out every single lottery ticket number combination. Because obviously that's not important. His goal wasn't to have a whole bunch of billionaires that won the lottery in the kingdom. Does money matter to God? Does looks matter to God? Does your vertical leap matter to God? Does it matter to God who the best boxer on the planet ever was? No. What matters to God is if you value the effort he went to to provide his word and to preserve his word enough to obey his word and not discount his word by saying things like, we only need to do New Testament things. We don't need to learn that Old Testament. How many of us knew the value of the book of Numbers as a child? How many of us know the book of Numbers and its value now? Show of hands. How about Deuteronomy? There's a lot of laws in there. In fact, the laws in Deuteronomy were so onerous that God decided he was going to change how that that law was applied. God knew that he was going to change that from the beginning, but he knew it was a hard thing to follow every 
single law. Now we're under a couple of laws, one being love God with everything, and the other one being love your neighbor as yourself. And every other law that God's made has that focus in mind. But that doesn't mean the Old Testament has no value. That doesn't mean that the stories that we read and the life lessons and the morality lessons that we read in the Old Testament are of no value. Here in the book of 2 Timothy, this is a New Testament book. But what are they referencing when they're talking about Scripture? They're not talking about their writings. They're not talking about their contemporaries' writings. They're talking about the Old Testament books and how those books, how God's laws, how his rules, how God thinks, his mindset, has value. It's profitable. So that every man may be adequate and equipped for every good work. Speaking of the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 29 through 33. This just happens to be right after God set forth some of the first laws. We read here, Oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me and keep all my commands always. That was true then. Is that still true today? Go tell them to return to their tents. But you stay here with me so that I may give you all the commands, decrees, and laws you are to teach them to follow in the land I am going, I'm giving to possess. Right now I'm working with the county and the state to try and get a building permit. It is an exercise in patience. Uh, most recently, and this is by no means a, an exhaustive list, but most recently, they responded to my dad and I in email saying, you didn't call out where you were putting smoke detectors. Well, the reason they do that is because someone at some point in history built the house and the inspector failed them because they didn't put smoke detectors. And then they went back to the county and said, but you never told me I had to have smoke detectors. God's laid it out. If it's not in the plan, it's not necessary. Right? Contrary, if it is in the plan, it's a requirement. This isn't just a book of encouraging stories and heartfelt, warm, fuzzy feelings. It's also a book of, here's how you do godly things. And if you know this story, you know that just before it, God spoke from a mountain and it terrified the people so much they begged Moses to instead talk to God so that they wouldn't die from hearing his voice. And it's within that context that God says, I wish or I hope that in their hearts they would be inclined to fear me. God means business. And the book that he gave us is real, and it's to be taken seriously. It's not to be discredited. It's not to be added to, and it's not to be taken away from. So after he tells Moses, you stay here, and I'm going to give you every commandment and every decree and every law that you're supposed to teach them, he says, so be careful to do what the Lord your God has commanded you, do not turn aside to the right or to the left. Walk in obedience to all that the Lord your God has commanded you, so that you may live and prosper and prolong your days in the land that you will possess. And as we've been going through some of the adult classes, we see the crumbling of man's ability to do this. We see the crumbling of their desire to continue fearing the Lord. We see the atrophy and the shrinking of the righteousness of the people. In Psalm 103, verses 13 through 18, 
As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how he formed us, or how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children and those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. I like how this passage opens up with the, the picture of a father and his compassion on his children. And in the context of God who formed us from dust knows that knows our weaknesses. He knows how frail we are. He knows our lifespan. He knows that we're just a, a breath away from death. But he also built into us the ability to obey. So he knows we have the capacity to do as he asks. He knows our limitations, and he knows our shortfalls. And he is a compassionate father. He's a compassionate father to those who obey his precepts. He's a compassionate father to those who love him and who fear him. In John chapter 3, verses 15 through 19, we read that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And again, we have a picture here of God loving his children and loving the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So yeah, the purpose of, of God sending Jesus to this world was not for condemnation. The purpose was that we would have an avenue of salvation. Again, it rests on us whether we fall into the God will take care of you or God will take care of you camp. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Then he spells this out. This is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And that's what it all always boils down to. Whatever the excuse is to not do what God wants you to, it boils down to, I want to do things my way. I want to do things the way that I understand them to be. I want to do things that God doesn't want me to do. And by that, we condemn ourselves because we love darkness rather than light. Naturally, our natural man loves to do things the way we want to do them. Most of us have or will have children, and most of us will notice that at some point, there's going to be two, cho two toys. Which toy does the kid want? doesn't really matter. It's, it's the one that you don't want them to have, right? You hand them the one toy and they reach for the other one. I saw over here with Mitch. <laughs> Mitch and little Conrad. Conrad was pointing at something and Mitch handed him the toy and he dropped it. So Mitch gave him his crutch and oh man, that's what he wanted, that crutch. What he's going to do with the crutch, he doesn't know, but that's what he wants. We're all that little kid. And crutch isn't a bad thing to want. But the example's there. We want bad things sometimes. A lot of time. How many of us reach for the diet because they want that taste of gross? I had a Mountain Dew last night for the first time in months. And it was a regular Mountain Dew. You know what I had two nights before that? A diet. And it was gross. <laughs> You, uh, 
as my daughters go. Yeah, we want what we shouldn't have. And whether it's a benign thing, like play with the crutch, or whether it's something that will kill you, like get addicted to heroin, it's for, different for different people, but the natural man frequently chooses darkness over light. God knows this. God made us. He knows we're nothing more than just glorified dirt. Right? He knows all of our abilities. He knows all of our limitations. All he asks is admit that he's God, fear him, love him, obey him. And he's given us everything to mold our lives after. So, we've covered the God who gives. One other aspect of this is God who keeps his word. How good is any of this if God has these promises, if God has these methods, if God has these uh, knowledge bombs, dropping knowledge on all of us, but he doesn't keep his word? So God's word, he tells us that if we love, obey, and follow him, he's going to let us live forever with him, that he's going to give us eternal life. God's word is you should live your life this way and you shouldn't live your life that way. And he's got books detailing out how that is divided up. If he doesn't keep his word, what's it worth? We go to this passage a lot for a different reason. But like most passages, you can learn different things in different passages or different things in the same passage. We come to this chapter a lot to determine that God isn't a man, to determine that there's one God and that's God, and God's not a man. But there's a really important message in here additional to that. There's actually several. Spoiler alert for those who don't know. Numbers 23, 18 through 20, and then 25 and 26. But then he spoke his message. Arise, Balak, and listen. Hear me, son of Zippor. God is not human, that he should lie. Okay, that's pretty, pretty clear. God is not human, that he should lie. He's not a liar. God, he's not a human being, that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? I have received a command to bless. He has blessed, and I cannot change it. And then a few ver verses down, we get a little bit more of the context of this story. Then Balak said to ba Balaam, neither curse them nor not, or neither curse them at all, nor bless them at all. And Balaam answered, did I not tell you, I must do whatever the Lord says. So two reasons I wanted to come here. God's not a human being that he will lie. He keeps his word. He doesn't go back on his word. We read a little bit about that this morning. God made a covenant with David. He's not going to go back on that covenant. God made a covenant with Abraham. He made a covenant with all of us that choose to be baptized. He made promises. And then the second reason I wanted to come here is reading this last verse, Balaam answered and said, did I not tell you I must do whatever the Lord says? So these people, it was in Balaam's financial interest to do what the Lord didn't say. But he said, I have to do what God told me to do. And just for everyone's information, all of the prophets did the same. They were put in positions they didn't want to be in because they had to do them so that the story that God wanted us to have, the commandments that God wanted us to have, the morality that God wanted us to have, the lessons that he wanted us to learn were not lies. They weren't polluted. They weren't fake. They were real. So that God's word, as they were told through mouths of prophets and through mouths of other men and through mouths of the father to the son and the mother to the son, did not change. 
We talked this morning, some, someone said something like 6,000, I don't remember, Six, oh, was that 6,000 discrepancies, but there's like 600 different translations of the Bible. And our brother Loring said, I believe that you can find the truth that God has done a good enough job preserving the truth that if you're looking for it and not looking to disprove it, but if you're looking for it, you can find it. And that lines up with what God said. I've preserved and I've provided everything that you need for salvation. And it's because of this sort of thing, Balaam saying, I have to do what God told me to do. Even in the face of danger. Many of these men died because of what they wrote. Many of these men. One time, a king asked a prophet not to talk because every time he said bad news. And the prophet said, well, I have to talk because God told me to. Here's some bad news. And the king said, see, I don't like that guy. But the reality is they had to. And they did that for our benefit and our children's benefit and the generations that come before and after us. They put their lives on the line and they lost their lives so that we could have the truth. A God that does not lie. God keeps his word. Titus verse, or chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. Again, this word truth, we talked a little bit about trust, truth, and faith on Wednesday night. How important is truth? How important is it that we know that it's truth and not a lie? In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. Preaching still going on. And if we're preaching based off of leaning on any one man's understanding or any one man's anecdotal life stories or this is what I've learned in my however many years I've been doing this, prideful boasting, it should be suspect. We should question whether or not it's accurate. If we're doing the preaching based on God's word, if we're leaning on his word, if we keep going back to that, if we keep going back to the record of a being that cannot lie through the mouths of people that died preserving that, That's what we're being asked to do. And in Psalm chapter 33, verses 4 through 9. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. How much of this does the modern world believe? How much of this is taught in our school system? How much of this is at the forefront of the modern day's world? And yet God preserved these writings so that we can have faith and so that we can, if we want to, learn and follow. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verses 9 through 12. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. But those who hate him, he will repay to their face by destruction. He will not be slow to repay them to their face, those who hate him. Therefore, take care to follow the commands, decrees, and laws I give you today. 
If you pay attention to these laws and are careful to follow them, then the Lord your God will keep his covenant of love with you as he swore to your ancestors. Just kind of recapping on the whole idea of God preserving his word, giving us everything that we need with the expectation that we learn it and that we obey it. And this idea of if you don't follow it, you're in the camp of hating God. God pays attention to these things. God separates out the category, light and darkness. And we talked a little bit before about our responsibility to ourselves, our responsibility to make sure that we go and learn, make sure that we go and, and uh, grow in the truths of God's word. But the next step beyond that is to be able to encourage one another. I talked a little bit about preaching and what we're supposed to be preaching, the source material of what we're supposed to be teaching. The encouraging one another. What do you think we're supposed to encourage one another with? Is it supposed to be just vain, empty words of encouragement? Good job. You've got this. Go team. Trophy time. That's pretty superficial stuff. We have a mirror that we can inspect ourselves with at home, right? Most of us. Maybe we don't all look in it, but most of us have a mirror. The Bible is the guideline. It's not a physical appearance guideline. It's a make sure you're doing this. Make sure you're not doing this. That's the mirror. That's the rule book. That's the guide that we're supposed to do. Anybody know what these are right here? Someone, someone said the word. I asked if you knew. Okay, yeah. They're Karens. What happens if you're responsible for one Karen and your friend's responsible for one Karen and instead of helping them, you go and kick their Karen over? What if our eternal life was dependent on that? I'm not saying it is. Karens really don't matter, but I'm using this to do a point. You notice these Karens, these ones are just pretty basic ones, right? There's none of this fun, fancy balancing. It's just straight up and down. Little tangent. I've been going to physical therapy for three weeks. I fell and hurt my back. I did not have a mirror in my camper until I did. My wife went and bought a mirror about three weeks ago. We live on a camper. For those who don't know right now, it's a whole thing. Remember the whole looking for a building permit? Yeah, we're living in a camper until that happens. So camper mirrors show you this much. You get to look at your face, make sure you brush your teeth well. About it. My wife got a full body mirror three weeks ago, right before I started physical therapy. I'll give you guys an example of what I looked like when I went around the corner. Don Seitz know what I look like. He called it a pretzel. My wife calls it a question mark. This is me trying to stand up straight so that I can last another six minutes. You guys see over there? Yeah. This was me when I walked around the corner. And I went, well, that's not right. <laughs> Dawn's right. I do look like a pretzel. Let's see if I can move this over. Stand up. Oh, that's better. Oh, that hurts. Oh, let's go back. We're supposed to make sure we go straight, guys. This is, sp this is spiritual therapy time. I go three times a week to physical therapy. Three times a week here for spiritual therapy. We're supposed to make sure we're going straight. And how do we do that if we don't have someone that can help us? If it was just me out on an island and I'm reading a book and I'm leaning on my own understanding, do you think I'd be straight? Ish? Maybe, right? Do you think it might be skewed and biased to what I want to do? Yeah, we're supposed to use this as a guidebook. I'm not a very good guidebook of how straight I'm standing. But you guys see me stand. When you guys tell me, man, whew, you look terrible in really nice ways.
We should be doing that. And we should be asking, hey, how do I look? What does that mean? How do I look? Sometimes that's a trick question. How do I look? But we should be honest about that. How do I look? We should be, when we have, when we have problems, when we have questions, when we aren't sure of where our footing should be, we've got the guidebook, but we also have people with like precious faith that we can go to and say, what do you feel about this scenario? What should I do? How should I proceed? Should I proceed? We should be encouraging one another and building each other's cairns up. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8 through 11. But since we belong to the day, remember light and darkness, we're supposed to be belong to the day. Since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. How much do we see faith and love being used as a breastplate in, in media today? How about hope as salvation? And what does hope mean to us versus what hope means to some other people on the planet? What do we place our hope in? For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath. He didn't make us for that purpose. He sent his son not to condemn the world. Same words. It's the same meaning. He did not make us for suffering wrath. But to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Ephesians 4, 21 through 32. If so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Yeah, this, this thing, this thing that I want to do, but I know it's wrong, it's going to make me happy. We're being told, put that off. Put that former walk of life away. And be renewed instead in the spirit of your mind, spiritual therapy. That's what we are supposed to be doing. And that you put on a new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Sometimes the truth hurts. Sometimes you go, you know what? I think you're not standing up straight. I think you're going down the wrong path. And sometimes it's hard to receive that. It's hard to give that, and it's hard to receive that. But what better thing is there than the truth? If you go to the doctor and you have chest pain, and they say, oh, you just drank too much Mountain Dew, and don't tell you the truth, which, by the way, drink too much Mountain Dew might be the cause. But if they don't tell you the truth, if they go, ah, you know, you probably just need to sneeze, or whatever it is, that's not very helpful. That's not the truth. You want to know the truth. You want a God that doesn't lie. You want people that don't lie. You want prophets that tell the truth, that are bound and obligated and say, I have to do, and I have to say, and I have to write what God told me to. I have to say the truth. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. I tie these two verses to together. If you only rely on your anger, if you harbor that anger, you are giving place to the devil. That is, that is what this is saying. We have to learn how to get past that anger. We have to learn how to close that opportunity for Satan to come in and drive us away. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed 
unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. So this verse 31 ties right back with verse 26. Be angry and sin not. And then the instruction is don't give place to the devil. And then several verses down later, it says, get rid of it. Get rid of the bitterness. Get rid of your wrath, which wrath just means extreme anger. Get rid of that. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 through 25. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Does it sound like help, help other people build their cairns? Help other people build their lives according to God? Help other people find the true path and stay on the true path? Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. That's all I have for today. Thank you very much. All right, let's close the service today with song number 227, Working Out Your Own Salvation, 227. And let's stand, please. great God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for all of the blessings that you have given to us, your word for us, that we can follow it and find you and 
that we can learn and teach others also so that your family when you return to this when you return to this earth and establish that kingdom is great and numerous we ask that you fall short and to remember that we are but dust and forgive us when we do sin against you we all ask here for a place in that kingdom that's promised when you send your son back to the earth in jesus name we pray amen, amen.